Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, it's Roland again and we have another uh, coding critique, code challenge critique. And together with me tonight, uh, we have Ronald. Hello, Ronald. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to another week of Game of Apps challenges. This week we had a very interesting sorting problem that we introduced last week. So we saw a couple different approaches. Um, none of them were quite the same. So let's get, get into talking about them. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Ronald. Okay, so so just a quick uh, recap. Uh, the problem this week was a challenge to sort in place. So basically, you have an input array, uh, like we have on the left side. Uh, it could be any number of items in the array, but it contains uh, the digits 0, 1, and 2 uh, in some order. And you're supposed to sort it so that it looks, uh, the output would be what you see on the right side. So that's, uh, you know, simple enough. But the, the extra challenge this week is that uh, if you can sort it in place. So uh, what does order one space mean, Ronald? So normally when we do big O notation, it usually remi uh, talks about time complexity or the time it takes for the program to execute. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we're looking for big O of one space, which means that you can't create additional data structures that continue growing with the input space. So your solution, if you were successful, was to do something that either swapped it in place or you're allowed to have extra pointers or other data structures, but those extra data structures cannot grow with the input as well. Okay, awesome. Yeah, oh, the last point here we have written, uh, this This is an example, I think you mentioned this in the problem um, description uh, earlier in the week, is uh, this is an example where you would be programming in a memory constrained environment. Because like we said, right, in most, most environments today, the majority of programming, we, we, we are not memory constrained. So we, mm -hmm. we go for, uh, we would prefer to write algorithms that are easy to read and easy to maintain. But there are environments where you you, can, you need to program in a memory constrained environment and then this this constraint uh, of, of having using as little memory as possible is, is very useful. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Actually, oh, we'll, we'll see this in a lot, couple of different uh, solutions that were provided to us. Actually, the kind of the things that the students did in order to avoid using the sort is actually more inefficient. So for most of programming, uh, if you just you went straight ahead and used the built-in sort functions, they would be probably the most efficient anyway, because a lot of the language, you know, to the built-in language features, they've already optimized it to a point where it's like really good already. So mm -hmm. there, there's no kind of need to reinvent the wheel of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Okay, great. So let's uh, let's take a look at the first submission. So this first submission here was uh, submitted by Irene, and we have some graphics here to show uh, what this algorithm does. So basically, uh, what she does here. So here we have a sample array of a mixed set of numbers, and for lack of a better name, I'm calling this move to front and back. So basically, what this algorithm does is it looks at uh, it looks for zeros and moves all the zeros to the front of the list. Uh, to the left and then all the twos will be moved to the right of the list which is to the right so basically the algorithm goes and looks at the first item and is it a zero if it's a zero then it moves it to the front so it's already at the front so then it moves to the next one this is a two so then the two needs to go to the back of the list so it takes the two out of the array uh, and then inserts it or adds it to the to the back of the array. Okay, so then it just goes on, goes to the next one. That's a zero, so it takes that out of the array with a dot remove, and then it appends it to the beginning with the add to index zero. Yeah, and so then it just goes forth and does that. So the next one is a two, so that one goes to the end of the array, and so forth, yeah. Oh, okay, I got one more in the animation here. <laughs> got carried away. It looks pretty nice. <laughs> okay. Oh, I, I thought I'm done. Okay. okay, there we go. So we're back at Irene's code. So what do you think of this uh, algorithm? So I guess overall it's relatively efficient um, in terms of the kind of looking at you know, as you're traversing the array. 
Um, but one thing that we kind of talked about pre-show was that, you know, in using the ad and remove, actually overall, it's a very expensive uh, operation in the grand scheme of things because when you do an ad to the front of the array, now you're basically shifting the whole array to the right and then putting an element in. Or, you know, if you're removing some element in the, you know, towards the front or even the middle, then you're taking that element out, shifting the whole array to the left and then putting the element at the end. So, mm-hmm. uh, oh, I mean, overall, it does achieve the objective of doing it in place. But I mean, overall, for time complexity, I would say it's probably not the best solution mm-hmm. but we didn't set those constraints so yeah that's right good job. <laughs> that's right you didn't set the, the constraint you gave was an order one space so so yeah so it does meet it but yeah you're absolutely right uh, it is uh, it is very expensive to be you know uh, moving items around in an array shifting each time you add to the beginning like you said that shifts the whole thing so that's expensive mm-hmm. um but the thing I like about this is they're very easy to understand because if I were to if you were to give me a, a sorted uh, an unsorted list of items, this is how I would sort it too, right? Physically, I would take all the zeros, put it on on the left side, to all the twos, mm-hmm. put it on the right side. So it follows, you know, what what I would do. So from that perspective, I kind of I kind of like it. But yeah, it is it is expensive in terms of the CPU cost. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we we um, we have a, a for loop here with. It. A for loop here where you're using uh, int i as the index and then within the for loop you are decrementing i that's that's quite very that's quite dangerous uh, because uh, you know uh, number one it's very complicated to to kind of reason this through uh, and more likely than not this this is a source this would be a source of a bug where you know when you're iterating over a number and then inside the iter in in the, inside the loop you're you're changing the value of that uh, index that you're iterating on so that's um in in this case uh you got it to work uh and so that's that's good but but i think um yeah i i think instead of decrementing i uh you know you can do something else if you need to if you need the value of i minus one then set that to a different variable and then use that so so it's the the meaning uh, the meaning of i uh, doesn't change across each uh, iteration mm-hmm. okay so hope, hope that makes sense um irene but yeah that's that, that would be very dangerous if i were doing a code inspection uh on any project i would flag that and i would ask that to be rewritten because that's that's just a bug waiting to happen mm-hmm. okay okay awesome let's let's take a look at the next one so this next one here is submitted by uh, Faisal. <laughs> so so Faisal's algorithm we're calling it move smallest to front so it's uh, what it does is uh, it it looks at the entire uh, array, and then uh, it moves it moves it to the front. So the first item zero is already the smallest. So it goes to, it goes to, reads through the entire array and says, is there anything bigger than this number? If 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 there is, then let's move it uh, to the left. So since zero is already the smallest, then it doesn't move it to the left. Then it goes to the next uh, the next item in the for loop is the, the number two. So then it goes and looks down the whole list and it finds an, the number that's uh, the smallest compared to two. So in this case, that would be the zero at the very end. And then it would swap uh, zero and two. Uh, and then it would go on to the next one. So in this case, one, uh, it would say, is there any number that's smaller than one? And in this case, it's a zero. And because it goes through the entire list, then it picks a zero at the very end of the list. And then it swaps it, yeah, and so forth, and it goes down like that. So then it gets to the zero is already the smallest, and then it goes to the two. So again, it finds the number that's the smallest, and it swaps that out. Okay. So yeah, so that's 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 what Faisal's algorithm does. So uh, this is this is minor stuff, Faisal, uh, but. Uh, uh, you know the the structure where you you uh, you define all the arrays here at the beginning of the function. That that used to be standard programming practice. A lot of coders used to code that way, you know. But um, but nowadays, 
uh, and I, I kind of like this better too. Like nowadays, uh, you know, I would tend to define, declare this variable right where about I'm about to use it. So instead of having int temp number there and then not using temp number till sometime later, uh, I would say int temp number right here and then assign it right away. So so here I would say int temp number equals colors dot get i. Um, because you know, if if uh, the thing is, um, what's that word where you're you're carrying a lot of uh, information on your head? So you're carrying a lot of information. So, what what's happening here is that if you declare all these variables up front, I'm carrying all the information in my head until later on I have to use it. But if I don't declare it till later, then I only have to carry information for two variables because I'm using it in this for loop. And then later on when I'm using temp number, that's when I that's when you. Um, you, you declare it. It's it's more helpful, I think, for for me as a programmer because then I'm I, I'm only, you know, I I only put into my brain what I need to be thinking about at that moment. Mm -hmm. From a compiler perspective, the compiler will optimize it in however best way uh, it, it knows. But uh, so it is more just for, you know, I don't know. What are your thoughts, Ronald? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, uh, the way he put it, I mean, I would expect those to be more like class variables or something like that. So, yeah, for, for something like a local variable, especially like if it's a temp variable where I'm just using it as a, you know, as a pointer or something like that, I would definitely initialize it in place where I'm using it. But I, I mean, I guess my convention that I've seen a lot of times is, you know, if it's a class variable or something that's used throughout the whole... You know, you know, class basically. Then, yeah, definitely put it up top because that's where people expect it to be when they're seeing it. But yeah, for something like a function, a uh, variable inside a function, yeah, I, I would probably also tend towards just declaring it when I'm using it. Yeah, yeah. Actually, while while we're on this line, sorry, I'm on my soapbox. <laughs> while we're on this line of thinking, I was thinking too for these next two variables, smallest number and smallest number pause uh, position. I guess those two. Uh, this is going in the principle in in declaring variables in the in the most specific, specific scope possible. Mm -hmm. So, smallest number is actually only used inside of the for loop scope, right? So, so then I would I would declare those variables inside the for loop, not outside, because it's not used at all outside of the for loop. So mm -hmm. I would I would declare it, you know, at the beginning of the for loop. So basically, you know, where where you have these two lines there, uh, you can just say int smallest number equals colors dot get i, and then int smallest number pause uh, equals yeah. i. Yeah. It just uh, yeah, so, I, oh go ahead yeah. I mean I. I like this this actually reminds me of a recent bug that i was dealing with where um you know we, the scope of the variable made it so that we were using the same variable in two namespaces mm. so as a result that bug uh you know occasionally it would override an, the other variable yeah <laughs> um so I mean, it's not quite the same case in, in that in that bug scenario, but yeah. I mean, just looking at this, like when you're having things you know, at the top of the class or, or in this case, at the top of the function, you might forget if it's a longer function, you might forget where you declared it and then yeah. you might reuse that same variable name and then pretty soon you're, you know, doing all these gymnastics just to yeah. like remember which one and then you might forget and you accidentally reuse the variable locally and then it doesn't do something and the outside scope so yeah 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 so i mean so that that one so Faisal, I, I we're not mean, meaning to pick on, on on your code here it just just so happened that we saw it and so it's a good a good a good segue but it is it is a good uh, programming practice to um, to try to keep things into the smallest scope possible so in this case if these variables are not used outside of the for loop then only declare them inside the for loop that way there's you're not contaminating the namespace outside of the for loop Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. Let's go to the next one. And okay. This one here. Uh, I, I better make sure I'm getting the right person now. Okay. <laughs> this is okay. This is Bastian's. Bastian's. Um, so he has, he has a different algorithm. So let's take a look at his algorithm. So I, I'm calling his algorithm move and insert. So what he does is um, he takes a look at the first two, 
uh, and then he, uh, so he looks at the second uh, item uh, number two and he says um, is there uh, is there is 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 too smaller than whatever is on the, on the, on its left and uh, it's not all right so then it goes to the next one and it says one okay is one smaller than anything to its left uh, in this case uh, two is smaller so then it moves to one one space over and then it compares one to zero it's one smaller than zero and it's not it's not so then it puts one down where where that space was now it looks at the next one so zero is zero smaller than two uh, it is so then it moves two over and then is zero smaller than one uh, it, uh, it is so it moves one over as well and then is zero smaller than zero it's not so then it uh, it puts it in there so yeah so it keeps doing that um, uh, all the way through until it gets to the end so I think this might be the last animation so zero is less than two so it moves the two over it moves the next two over is zero less than one it's not so one uh, moves over and then it puts zero down in that and then and so on okay so that's uh, that's Bastian's uh, algorithm um, what do you think of this algorithm Ronald um, well, first of all, I do like the relatively good comments about what he's thinking about. So mm -hmm. kudos to that. Um, for the algorithm itself, um, I guess overall, like kind of similar to, I guess more towards Irene's a little bit, just because it's, it's really kind of traversing it and then looking backwards and it keeps, you know, keeps moving that element back one by one so um time complexity wise probably not the best because you're doing so many checks just to move one item back and then as the as the operation grows or as the input grows you know your operations grow exponentially right so uh not the best but i mean it does do it in oh, one space so i guess yeah Good job. Yeah. So two points. Yeah. <laughs> two points. Yeah. So uh, although this construct here is correct, swap index ii, so it's a post decrement. Um, I, I tend to, I, I, I used to enjoy doing this, but but now as, as I'm, you know, nowadays I'm thinking I would prefer that to be in a separate statement on its own, because because then. Um, uh, again, it's uh, it goes to um, overloading what what you're trying to hold in your brain, right? So when I read this line, I say, okay, it's swapping to it's oh, it's setting it's setting the, an item uh, at swap index plus one, and then after that, then I want to increment swap index, but putting it together in the same line, then now I'm I'm having to to put those two thoughts together. Uh, then then you know it's it's not you know it's I can still understand it but it just takes me you know a split second longer to uh, to, to think about it um, so you know at the cost of having an extra line I think you know I think it's worth it uh, makes it easier to, to read mm -hmm. it, it, I get it just makes the behavior non-obvious without understanding that whole line whereas if it was in a separate line it's very clear that you're decrementing the index and yeah. saving it so yeah just having it all in one line without you know understanding it and and just as a, as you're looking through it you know if there's ever a bug in that place it's not obvious right away that that's yeah. the problem yeah that's right okay uh this one is from william so this uh william's code also implements a similar algorithm to um to to bastions so we don't have to discuss it, but I'm just showing here that it's a it's a different implementation, but very similar algorithm. Okay, this next submission is by uh, Eric. Uh, so this is a different algorithm. Um, we're calling it the, the iterative swap. <laughs> so what this algorithm does? So it's a uh, it's two uh, two for loops, one nested within the other. The first for loop goes through everything, and then the second for loop goes uh, one. Uh, one ahead of it and then 
Oh, sorry. Then what you do is you compare uh, uh, you compare the first item in the first for loop and the first item in the in the second for loop. And if if the if the first one is greater than the second one, uh, you would swap it. In this case, uh, zero is less than two, so there's no need to swap. Uh, and then. You look at the one here. Uh, one is still greater than zero, so there's no need to swap. Zero is still um, not. And so actually, for this first iteration, you would go through all the way to the end and not do any swap because zero is already the, the smallest number. So then the second iteration of the outer for loop now is pointing at two. And then the inside for loop points at one. So it's one less than two. It is. So then uh, those two numbers are swapped. Then you look at zero. Is zero less than one? It is. So then that's swapped as well. Okay. And then at this point, is two less than zero? It's not. So then you go on. And again, because zero is already the smallest number, you go all the way to the end without doing any more swapping. And then you go to the next um, the next iteration. Is one less than two? It is. So then that's swap. And then two is not. Zero is less than one. So that's swap. And then again, zero is now the smallest, so you would go all the way to the end uh, without any more swapping. So it just goes on until you get to the end. Okay. So I think this is the last animation. All right. So what do you think of this uh, algorithm, Ronald? Um. Well, as you can tell from the animation, it's not super efficient because you're swapping elements you've already checked with later elements and then it would swap it you know if there's like let's say you swap the two and the one so now the pointer is looking at one and then later on a zero comes on and then you know you you swap the zero in so then the one pops to the later in the array so yeah not not the greatest in terms of <laughs> efficiency but it gets the job done and it is in O1 space now. I, I mean, I've been kind of saying this throughout for the last couple of submissions. I kind of wish I put in some time complexity on this problem. <laughs> but um, yeah, overall, I mean, I would say like, yeah, good good on you using the swap function. You found that. Um, and, and overall, the code is easy to read. Um, but yeah, if there was some efficiency you could have thought, thought about or, you know, made so this is not doing so many swaps um yeah then that would be even better yeah all right so that's uh that's eric so eric you get two points good job uh this next uh, submission is uh by aki okay so aki's uh submission does uh implements a similar algorithm to to eric's but my first my first pet peeve here is that well two pet peeves aki and I've mentioned this many times, formatting and spacing, right? I mean, if you look at the formatting here, like this for loop, this for here is like at the same indentation level as this here. Uh, and it, it doesn't need to be. And then this whole block of code, there's absolutely no space. It's like, <laughs> if I'm reading that, it's like, I, I can't take a breath because uh, there's no space. Right? <laughs> so, so Aki, uh, I took the liberty to, to rewrite this for you. And, and so this is how I rewrote it. And I think it's, it's better. It's easier to read, right? I mean, it still does exactly the same thing. It has everything you have in there, but it's a little bit more space. Uh, uh, so it's a bit easier to read. Okay. Awesome. So let's move on to the next one. So this submission is by Ali. So it's a bit interesting. So uh, it's a similar algorithm to um, to the previous two, but of course the code is, is different. Code structure is different. Um, now um, I had a couple of comments here. So the first interesting thing is that uh, Ali is using recursion here. So this is the this is the first submission I think we've seen uh, through uh, since we started the coding challenge this se this season, where we have recursion. But before I get into recursion, I want to talk about a couple of things that that could make the code easier to read. Um, one is uh, you see this this if here, and, and that if is also repeated here. Um, uh, there's actually no need to have a separate if inside that for loop because uh, I think, do I have a slide here? Yeah. So what I did was I rewrote it here. 
Um, so previously you had this if there. That that's basically your end condition for the for loop. So this colors that size minus one. You could you could put that right in there so where i is less than colors that size minus one. So if you rewrote re it this way, then then it's a little bit easier to to read. Uh, the second thing is. Um, you have this uh, this con oops you have this condition here uh, is sorted um, so basically you're you're going through the whole the whole array to s and and if if you see if you find one element that is not sorted then you set it sorted to false uh, and then but but uh, here if if it's true then you then you return right um, it's a it's inefficient because if I if after looking at the second item you've already determined that it's not sorted you don't need to check the rest of the array this one still goes and checks the rest of the array if if one if the first element or the second element is not sorted then there's no need to check the rest of the array so what i what i wrote here is that if if it's sorted is false you can break out of the for loop right away and then and then it'll check the the if right here so um makes it easier uh, uh, cleaner to, to read also. So that was my mm -hmm. first comment. Uh, my second comment is on the on the recursion. Um, so on the recursion, so what's happening here is that uh, uh, this for loop goes through the entire array and then at the end of this uh, for loop the largest element will be moved over to the to the end of the list. So at the very right. And then this recursion calls sort colors again, but but you're passing in the entire array, even though the the the, the last element of the array is already sorted. It doesn't need to be resorted again. And uh, I don't know if you learned recursion uh, uh, formally or if you just kind of read up on it, Ali, but, but one of the principles of recursion is that each time you go and recurse, you want your scope to be a bit smaller so that at the end you'll have an end condition. So you, you have a good end condition here, which is, uh, so that's, that's good. But, but each time you're calling the recursion, your scope does not change. It's still the same scope, right? Colors here is the same as colors there. So what I would suggest is instead uh, do it in a way where after after this for loop here you know that the uh, the last item on your list is already sorted. Then the next time when you call the recursion here, uh, do it on the entire array except for the last item because the last item is already sorted. And if you do that, then each time you, this recurses, the, the scope gets smaller and smaller. And then eventually your end condition here, instead of reading uh reading through the entire array to see if it's sorted you just need to see is the size of your array colors dot uh, size if it's equal to one then you've hit the end of your array uh, of your recursion so that's that's more efficient than actually going through the entire uh this for loop going through the entire uh list just to see if everything is sorted so that's that's my uh, my critique there. Uh, any thoughts, Ronald? Um, yeah, I mean, for this problem, I mean, yeah, good good on you for using recursion, but it, I mean, I guess it's really not necessary almost. So we other other than you know in in school or these kind of programming challenges you generally don't see recursion in the wild because recursion in general is just not a good practice because it kind of leads to unpredictable results sometimes especially you know you might be going down multiple levels of recursion which you know it's not super efficient so in general other than I mean in these kind of programming challenges they expect you to rec do recursion but then you never use it <laughs> when you're writing actual code. I so, mean, I, so I guess I have used it, but not not very often. Yeah, not very yeah. often. But I'm sure. I'm sure there is. Yeah. I mean, cases where you would use it, but I, I would say it's it's the not the norm. Yeah. Um, but and, you know what yeah, I was saying so, earlier about really nice code. Some of the nice codes I've seen are actually recursion because they boil down the problem to something so. Uh, 
so elegant and makes so much sense. Yeah, so you, you have an algorithm, you know, it applies to this, but it, you apply the same algorithm all the way through and then you're done, right? Mm -hmm. So so from that perspective, it could be, it, you know, it, yeah. I mean, if, if used in the right uh, context and the right situation, yes. I guess. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, again, it's like another tool, right? So, yeah. but I mean, I would say I haven't really seen it in the wild. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, fair fair enough. There there is cases where you will use it. Um, but I guess I guess kind of what Roland was talking about, where you don't really set up the base case properly. So uh, I mean, I, I don't. We don't want to go into a recursion class here. But um, yeah, I mean, just the fact that you don't set it up properly, and then you're kind of using recursion, but it becomes, you know, the problem. I guess the problem set remains the same throughout all the recursion. So you're mm -hmm. just doing the same amount of work almost yeah. in each iteration. So it just becomes this very bloated execution. Yeah. Um, I mean, in some ways it's, it's, it's worse to have bad recursion than no recursion at That's all. True. So, <laughs> so, um, for, in, in that aspect, if, yeah, if, if recursion is something new and you're just using it to learn great, I mean, we always encourage you to learn something new, but I think, yeah, just going through this, yeah, maybe go back to the drawing board and revise it. So it's, uh, you know, you can set up the, the, the end case properly and then you pop up um, all the different iterations and then you're kind of getting that, uh, you know, that, that, that final solution in one go yeah, uh, without having to recompute it all the work every time. Yeah. So again, uh, not 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 uh, not picking on on you, um, Ali. But uh, and, and uh, like I said in the beginning, I don't know if um, you were ever taught recursion formally, or you just kind of, you know, saw some code on the on uh, on the internet and just uh, kind of picked it up that way. But there are some main principles, like what uh, Ronald and I said, right? Having your base case set properly. So in this case, you know, this would be a good base case. And if you set the base case, then you know that you, uh, each round of your recursion, you want your scope to get smaller, because you want to get to this, right? So then, then that would be that would be the, the proper way of using recursion for this uh, for this problem. But you know, your code still works, uh, so. You still get two points, I guess, Ronald. <laughs> two points, okay. All right, so I think we're almost done. We have one more. Uh, so this one uh, was a, a little bit more complicated. This one was submitted by Mackenzie. And he says it right here in his uh, notes that um, that he actually uh, used this opportunity to learn heap sort. Um, which, which I think might be overkill for <laughs> for this for this problem. So we're not going to walk through the the code because uh, uh, that would take a long time to, to provide an anal analysis of um, of heap sort. But uh, but yeah, good on you on on, on learning heap sort. Um, I guess it does meet the requirements. Uh, it it doesn't increase space uh, with the size the size of the space used doesn't increase. Uh, with with the size of the list mm -hmm. yeah okay so i guess after seeing all the everyone's work i mean there is one thing i guess one solution that i had in mind oh, okay. that i was i guess i was kind of disappointed no one <laughs> thought of it so the simplest solution you could come up with is actually if you just went through the array and you counted up all the zeros, ones, and twos that, that were in there present in the array. And then you go back and you do a second pass to overwrite the exact number of zeros, the exact number of ones, and the exact number of twos in the array. <laughs> so That's quite you didn't a need to do any, quite of a this, yeah, any of the swapping, you didn't need to do actually for this particular problem because, again, you're just doing the sort yeah. in the three, the three um, numbers. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing that necessarily for other problems because, you know, there might be other constraints in place, but for this particular problem, yeah. just read it once and then write it <laughs> once and then you're done. That's, 
<laughs> when when you mentioned to me this uh, day before the call, I, I didn't think about this, this solution, but it kind of makes sense. It works because uh, because we know that there's only zeros, ones, and twos. So you only mm-hmm. know that you're looking for three elements. So if you count five zeros, six ones, and eight twos, then you just write that five zeros, six ones, and eight twos, and you're done. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess uh, if you're sorting like uh, any any type of random array, then you don't know what the elements are. So in that case. Would it still work? I, it would still work. That algorithm would still work, right? I guess you would build a dictionary or a hash table of. Uh, yeah. 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 It just. Yeah. I guess. I guess. For other problems, you know, with if there's like a lot of different numbers, uh, you know, usually these kind of problems they don't want you to use that kind of super naive approach where you're just like reading it and then rewriting the whole array. Yeah. They kind of want to see the doing the swaps and things. Um, which you know for for the most part everyone did but for this particular problem you could have gotten away with something very simple no but i'm thinking ronald even even for larger arrays the algorithm you just talked about it might still be a good algorithm right because because maximum two two passes right yeah yeah well i guess i'm just more referring to the problems where they want you to use like oh you want to use some sorting algorithm right and this is totally not it yeah so so yeah i mean depends on the problem if if obviously if they don't leave any constraints this is valid but yeah yeah, as always refer to the instructions and follow the instructions but i guess the good thing that you brought this up is thinking outside of the box right Mm -hmm. because this is out this is out of the box thinking yeah. And and it, it, it works and it'll work for any type of data set and yeah. yeah. Interesting. Actually actually some of the I mean if we're talking about embedded programming, if you go I mean some of the you know old school programmers that were programming in the eighties or nineties, you know, on the first gen game consoles where you know you only have thirty two megs of RAM or something like that. You know, there's a lot of these little hacks that they had to do mm-hmm. and it's usually these out of the box yeah. solutions that that they were, you know, they would do something like you're clearing the RAM or you're maybe even like overriding some of the console's protected memory just to get yeah. that extra little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, those those things are usually all out of the box thinking. So Yeah. Those those are the real hackers when they when they, they take advantage of some undocumented feature of the device to, to you know squeeze out every single last performance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now we have electron apps that are 100 megs of RAM. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder, is that are we are we improving or are we regressing? Right. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that was uh, that was that was good. Um, so thank you, Ronald. Uh, thank you, everyone, for for. Um, staying tuned uh, if you if you like this if you found this useful and you learned something give us a thumbs up uh otherwise uh, we'll we'll see you at the next uh, the next coding challenge keep up the good work uh you know yep. good job on uh, on keeping up with this and this week everyone got two points ronald mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> so awesome all right good job everyone okay take care see you next time <laughs>